Hi, I'm Wes van Woorden and thank you for joining Eurocrypt. In this video, I will be discussing our recent work on advanced lattice receiving on GPUs with tensor cores. And this is joint work with Liu Dega and Mark Stevens. So we'll start with a quick overview of our work. So most of the NIST post quantum crypto finalists are based on hard lattice problems. And practical crypto analysis is important to understand the concrete security and to pick concrete parameters for these schemes. Currently, lattice sieving algorithms have the best practical and aesthetic runtime to solve these hard lattice problems. And our question was how fit are different sieving algorithms for specialized hardware, in our case, GPUs. And this includes the more advanced sieving techniques that give large practical gains. So our contributions. We present the first GPU implementation using all of state-of-the-art sieving techniques. This improves both the runtime and energy efficiency by two orders of magnitude compared to a CPU-only approach. And this significantly improves several lattice problem records. So we are able to solve these problems in much higher dimensions. And additionally, we present the first optimized implementation of the asymptotic best-known sieve, better known as BGL, both for CPU and GPU. So what's lattice? Well, a lattice is a discrete group that's generated by some bases. And of course, lattice can be generated by multiple bases. Given any basis, the shortest vector problem asks to find a shortest non-zero vector of the lattice. And in high dimensions, this becomes a hard problem. The related problem is the bounded distance decoding problem, where you're given a target that lies close to the lattice vector, and the goal is to return this lattice vector. So to give an indication of concrete hardness of the short vector problem, we have the TU Darmstadt lattice challenges. So as a challenge, we're given a random d-dimensional lattice, and the goal is to find a vector that's at most 5% longer than the expected minimum length of the short vector. And we want to solve this problem using lattice sieving. So what's lattice sieving? Well, the idea is to start with a big list of exponentially many lattice vectors. Then inside of this list, we try to find pairs of factors that are close to each other, such that their difference would give a short lattice vector. And what we then do is we replace a long vector in our list with this new shorter vector, and we repeat this until we have only a bunch of short factors left. So we would like to execute these lattice sieving algorithms on specialized hardware, in our case, graphics processing units, better known as GPUs. So on this small part of a GPU, you can already have 64 floating point cores, 64 integer cores, and 8 tensor cores, about which I will talk a bit more later. So in total, on a GPU, you can have thousands of cores, which is much more than the dozen or so you have on the CPU. However, on the CPU, each of these cores can work independently and execute their own instructions. On the GPU, all the cores have to work in batches of at least 32, and execute a single construction on all of these cores at the same time. Also, each of these cores have a very limited amount of registers that you can use and, and memory that's local. So what are these tensor cores? Well, originally they have been developed for machine learning and they can do one thing very well, and that is efficient low precision matrix multiplication. So what do I mean with low precision? Well, I mean 16-bit floating point precision. While a normal float would be 32 bits, or double would be 64 bits large. However, this 16-bit precision is good enough for our purposes. And with efficient, I mean that on these old models we used, we can have up to 108 16-bit teraflops on a single GPU. And on the newer models, we even can reach more than 300 16-bit teraflops. So how, when we compare this to a current best CPU, these would reach, with like 64 cores, would reach at most about 5 teraflops. So you can already see the, the order of two magnitudes improvement from these GPUs. So let's discuss the pros and cons of these GPUs, starting with the cons. First, as already mentioned, these things are not first though. 32 cores have to execute the same instruction, while on a CPU, every core can do what it wants. Secondly, these GPUs are an external device. And this means that the CPU with connect, that's connected with the main memory has a slow connection to the GPU and the main memory of this GPU. This means that the connection which goes via PCI bus in, for example, our uh, server is limited by only 16 gigabytes per second to send data from the main memory to the GPU. 
Now you can imagine if you have these GPUs that can get a performance of 100 teraflops per second, then you have to execute a lot of uh, instructions. You have to reach a lot of flop per byte that you transfer to this GPU. And this very much, uh, and otherwise you get very much memory bottlenecked. And also inside of the GPU, memory bottlenecks often limit the actual performance. And lastly, it's hard to adapt algorithms. For many algorithms that are in principle uh, serial or maybe can be uh, paralyzed on, on multiple CPU cores, uh, it can still be a whole research study to see how you can adapt them to GPUs, such as our work. But everything, if everything works together, then the pros are clear. You can get incredible performance, like hundreds of teraflops instead of just a few teraflops of a CPU. Uh, and additionally, these things are very energy efficient. So you're gonna get this incredible performance at only like at the same energy cost or maybe a factor two more. So we didn't build our implementation from scratch. Uh, we extended the so-called general sieve kernel, which is from a work from 2019. And this is an open source sieving framework and uh, implementation. And this implementation combines all the advanced sieving techniques, uh, including all implementation uh, tricks that you can think of. And it's fully parallel on uh, CPUs uh, for on a single machine. And they solve the CSP record at dimension 155 in about uh, two weeks. And this was only run on like 72 CPU cores and 256 gigabytes of memory was used. So if we compare this to the old way of solving the search factor problem with enumeration, uh, which is uh, asymptotically inferior method, but does only use polynomial memory, hence it's trivial to parallelize. Uh, so for this method, the old records were at dimension 152, however using more than 800,000 core hours. So it's clear that these sieving methods, uh, both in asymptotically but also in practice, uh, usually improve on the enumeration. So now it's time to discuss these advanced sieving methods and how we adapted them to GPUs. So in general, our sieving process goes as follows. We have our big database of uh, lattice vectors, and then we have three phases that repeat. First, we have a bucketing phase where the database is partitioned into multiple buckets. Then we have the reducing phase where inside each bucket, we check all pairs for, a, uh, for close factors to give a shorter factor in return. And then we insert these short factors back into the database and we repeat this. So we start with discussing this bucketing, then the reducing part, and then we'll discuss some additional uh, advanced techniques. So first, the bucketing. What we want to do is want to partition the sphere and thereby partition our database. So suppose we have some bucket center C, then we want to uh, find all the factors in our database that are somewhat in the direction of C. And then this gives us a bucket. And then what we want to do is we want to only check for pairs within each bucket, if they are close to each other. And because they are already pointing somewhat in the same direction, this heavily increases the reduction probability per pair. So let's discuss some bucketing techniques. So first, as a benchmark, suppose we have no bucketing. Then we have to check uh, between all the pairs. So if a database of n vectors, then we have to check n squared uh, pairs. Uh, and this gives you a time complexity of 2 to the power 0 0.415 times the dimension. Now, the first bucketing method I want to discuss is the so-called BG1 uh, related bucketing method. Here we have random spherical cones uh, that form the buckets. And we have square root of n of these buckets, and each has size square root of n. And if you then do the computation, because of this improved probability to find uh, reductions, the, the time complexity goes down to 2 to the power 0 0.349 times the dimension. Uh, additionally, you can replace these random directions with random lattice factors. Uh, and then, because these, these centers of the buckets uh, give our lattice factors, we have two additional properties. First, you can immediately also find reductions with this uh, bucket center, because you're already computing the, the distances. Uh, 
And secondly, this bucket center can be used to not only check for, for pairs, but also for triples uh, that might give you a shorter factor. And note that to compute, to see if in, in which bucket a factor belongs, we need to compute inner products with lattice factors. And if you write it out, you actually get like a matrix product. And this is exactly what tensor cores are good at. So now let's discuss uh, another sieve, which is the BGL sieve. And this one uses structured spherical cones. Uh, and the structure comes from a product code. And using the structure, we can much more easily find uh, an appropriate bucket for each factor. And as a result, we can, for some parameter k, we can have much more buckets uh, that are of a smaller size. So in the end, depending on this parameter k, we can get a lot of small buckets very cheaply. And this results in a time complexity of 2 to the power 0 0.292 times the dimension. Uh, if you take this k uh, small, let's say logarithmically in the dimension. Uh, for our implementation, we have some additional tricks. Namely, instead of using explicit product codes and uh, explicit factors, we uh, use implicit directions. Uh, we take a, a lattice vector, and then we use permutations and Hadamard transforms, and then can, and then just read off the coefficients of this uh, to do the bucketing. You can read in the paper more about this. And the nice thing about this method is that it's very suitable for uh, factorized CPU instructions and also for GPUs. And actually, so we have a, a AVX CPU implementation, and we merge this into upstream into the general sieve kernel, the open source implementation. And this is currently the fastest CPU sieve uh, on there, uh, and it beats all the other sieves uh, around starting dimension 80 or 90. And I also want to mention that this PG1 sieve was the one that was used by the general sieve kernel uh, to set the old records at dimension 155. So we implemented these different bucketing techniques on the GPU, and they have the following uh, practical quality. And with this I mean is that the number of uh, reductions we find inside the bucket compared to what we uh, would expect uh, optimally in theory. So the black uh, bars here indicate the idealized uh, performance if all of these buckets would be perfectly uh, random. Uh, the second, the blue bars show the, the B, our BG1 implementation, and the red and orange ones show the BGL implementation for k equal to 1 and k equal to 2. And what we see is that the, the BG1 and the BGL for k is equal to 1 are very performant and come close to the idealized performance. And for the, the two B, K is 2 BGL version, we see a slight deterioration in performance. Uh, but uh, note that computing these buckets is much and much faster. So let's now discuss the reducing part. So suppose we have a bucket of a lot of factors. And for each pair, we want to check if they are somewhat close to each other. Now, if we write out this distance, then if we pre-compute all these lengths, what we actually need to compute is the inner product between these two factors. So we need to compute pairwise inner products. And this is exactly what tensor cores are good at. Additionally, we need sparse output and only return the successful pairs. If we don't do this, then we get a clear memory bottleneck. But this means that we can't use any uh, standard methods that have, have already been implemented. We need to implement our own uh, highly optimized matrix products. Uh, note additionally that the number of computations we need to do to compute all these pairwise inner products uh, is squared in the bucket size B, while the data you need to send to the GPU is only linear in the bucket size B. So this ratio between the amount of computation you do and the data you have to transfer improves for larger bucket sizes. So what does this mean for the performance? Well, if we exclude the overhead for transferring this data to the GPU, then we already get good performance at about the bucket size of 4,000. Uh, so we get about 65 teraflops at this uh, size. And this is very well compared to the theoretical limit of 108 teraflops, because we didn't count any of the instructions here to move the data within the GPU. 
However, if we include the overhead of sending this data to the GPU, we see that the performance drops significantly at these bucket sizes. And only at the bucket size of about 16,000 or higher, uh, we can get reasonable performance. So in short, for small buckets, uh, sending the data to the GPU is the actual bottleneck. Uh, and we need large buckets to reach optimal performance. However, large buckets go against uh, the whole idea of the BGL bucketing scheme. So what does this mean for our implementations? Well, on a CPU-only implementation, we don't have to have these, these very large buckets. And if we then compare the bg one sieve, which is indicated by the red line here, and we compare it to our BGL implementation on the CPU with k equal to 3, then the, uh, the BGL implementation becomes much faster at higher dimensions. And the crossover is already at dimension 90. Actually, in the implementation that we later merge into the general sieve kernel, this crossover already lies at about 10 dimensions lower even. However, for the GPU, we have this minimal bucket size to get optimal performance. And as a result, the BG1 implementation is actually faster than the BGL implementation in all the dimensions that we actually could sieve. And we estimate that the crossover point is maybe at only at dimension 150 or 160, uh, the sieving dimension here. So here we see a significant difference between the CPU implementation and the GPU implementation, that we get different trade-offs and a different crossover point uh, for when these asymptotic uh, best sieves actually take over from the uh, more practical but asymptotically worse sieves. So we have discussed the core parts of our implementation, but now discuss some of the more advanced uh, parts, namely one of the techniques that is very important in practice is the dimensions for free technique. So instead of sieving in the full lattice, we only sieve in a projected sub lattice uh, that's projected away from the first, say, L basis vectors. So we only sieve in this part. And then after sieving, we have a big list of short vectors in this context. And then we lift it back to the fill lattice using the by lifting. And because you have this many uh, vectors, uh, you can show that you can still find the shortest vector of the original lattice uh, for L that is about D over log T. And we can combine this with so-called progressive sieving. Instead of fixing this L a priori, uh, we can start with an L that's pretty large, and so a sieving dimension that's, that's pretty small, and then just uh, slowly, step by step, decrease this L uh, until the lifting actually finds the shortest vector on the full context. And this also means that if we do on-the-fly lifting, namely we just lift any shortest vector that we encounter, then we are much more likely to find this uh, short vector. So this means that we can have an extra uh, problem, namely can we officially detect if any pair of vector within a bucket, if we take the difference of these, if this uh, vector might lift to a short vector inside of the full context. And actually what this gives us is a BD problem on, on this, this uh, small context between 1 and L. So one way to solve this BD problem is using Babai lifting, as mentioned before. However, this has a quadratic running time in the, the lifting dimension. And that's why we introduced the so-called dual hash. So given a lattice, you can define a dual lattice by all vectors in its span that have an inner inner product with all the lattices in the primal. So if you pick one of these dual vectors, you can partition the lattice in uh, hyperplanes, where in each hyperplane you have all the lattice points that have a certain uh, inner inner product with this dual vector. But now, if we get a target that lies somewhat close to the lattice, then as a result, this inner product with the dual lattice is also expected to be somewhat small. So our dual hash doesn't consist of just a single dual vector, but multiple dual vectors, C1 and CK. And then the dual hash consists of all inner products between the target and these dual vectors. Now, if the distance of the target to our lattice is very small, then we can also expect the distance of this dual hash to the inner lattice to be small. Now note, to compute the first, we need the by lifting, which is quadratic in the dimension. And for the second part, uh, it's clearly linear in this k, if we have already pre-computed the dual hash. Uh, 
but we don't apply this to the full dimension we only apply this to like a smaller lifting dimension of say 16 and then uh, just using 32 or 48 dual factors seems enough for a very strong correlation and note that we can officially compute this dual hash uh, of the difference of two targets uh, because this function is linear and last but not least this is very suitable for GP as well but by lifting is very uh, serial in computation um, this can be easily parallelized so what's the correlation that we get well on the left we have the value of our dual hash and on the bottom we have the distance of our target to the lattice. So if you get a random target, then most of these targets lie very far from the lattice. And only just a few lie close enough uh, that we're interested in them. So if we set our filter at the height as this, then we don't have to compute the bias for all of these uh, pairs here. Uh, and we only have to compute it for these few pairs that lie below here. So that saves a lot of computation. So last but not least, we have to discuss memory. Lattice seeding algorithms are very memory intensive. And in our runs, we had to store up to half a billion of factors. So every byte we can save per factor saves us tens or hundreds of gigabytes in the end. However, the general sieve kernel stores lots of information per factor. For example, the coefficients in the base representation, the so-called Kronschmidt representation, the length of the factors, a unique identifier, uh, this lift target is pre-computed, this dual hash is pre-computed if we use it, uh, but also a pop count that's being used to quickly decide if two factors are somewhat close to each other. Um, and we want to remove all of this except this x, this length, and the unique identifier. And this means that we reduce the memory by more than 60%. So why can we do this? Well, this is actually an additional benefit from the fact that these bucket sizes have to have a minimum size of, say, 16,000. The overhead of computing all these things on the fly for inside of a single bucket is just linear in the bucket size times, say, d, d squared, or d to the dimension. However, after this, we have to check for reductions, and that is quadratic in the bucket size. So over these large buckets, the overhead of pre-computing all these things on the fly on the GPU is negligible. So what does this GPU implementation give us in terms of the TU Darmstadt let's challenges? Well, we got a new record at dimension 180. So here on the bottom, we show the dimension of uh, these challenges. And on the left, we show the wall time, which is just the, the real lifetime that these experiments run. So the purple points here represent the enumeration that are clearly very slow. Uh, note that these are very slow while still running on the supercomputer. The new records by the general CF kernel up to dimension 1 to 5 are represented here. And they are already significantly uh, faster. And these run on a single machine. And now in our work, we see that we get an order of uh, 2 magnitude speed up over the old results. While still executing all of this on a single machine. Uh, with a few GPUs, and even less CPU cores than were available on this uh, for the record for the general CF kernel. Uh, we stopped at dimension 180, which ran in about 51 days. And we didn't stop because we didn't want to run it longer, but we stopped because we reached our maximum RAM size of 1.5 terabytes. To go any higher, we need more uh, RAM, or maybe we need to save more memory. So to conclude, lattice sieving algorithms can efficiently be implemented on GPUs, including all these more advanced techniques. And the memory bottlenecks disappear when the buckets are large enough. And this has the extra benefit of saving lots of memory with negligible overhead. However, it's important to note that BGL beats BG1 in practice on CPUs, but the crossover for GPUs lies much and much higher. So thank you for watching this video. And here are some of the citations if you want to know more.